And uh, thank you everyone who came here fighting the weather for making a special effort. Uh, it's going to be an interesting dinner because we are not just celebrating two very distinguished senators, we are celebrating bipartisanship in foreign policy. We are celebrating Republicans and Democrats being able to work with each other. And we are also celebrating common sense and civility. I don't mean it as a joke. <laughs> that is what we definitely are celebrating. The fact, uh, how to put it, that Washington today is not overwhelmed with all these qualities. I don't need to spend a lot of time demonstrating that. Uh, this center was created back in uh, 1994 by former President Richard Nixon. Paul has correctly described me as a, a founding president, but in the spirit of full disclosure, there was supposed to be another larger office next to mine, which would belong to Richard Nixon, who would provide guidance to the center. But uh, that did not happen. President Nixon had died unexpectedly, so we became a product uh, of uh, his love with foreign policy and his interest in having a policy impact, but uh, he never was able uh, to move forward with the center and to help us to become what he wanted us to be. I still like to think that we have done a reasonably good job. A founding member of our board who was uh, very supportive of us through thick and thin wrote me a note the other day that President Nixon would be proud of what the center was uh, able to accomplish. I certainly hope so. By uh, using by using Jimmy Carter's criteria that we had good intentions. <laughs> and we have certainly tried. But again, to use Jimmy Carter's expression, let's face it, we had an incomplete success. Remember, this is a term Jimmy Carter have used after our failed operation to rescue hostages in Iran. It's very clear that Richard Nixon's fundamental objective, not just to have a, a center which would speak truth to power, but much more important objective, to have an impact on U.S. foreign policy discourse. Well, we did not do so well. I think we tried. Uh, we had some impact in terms of telling people that it's possible to go beyond uh, bumper sticker cliches in talking about foreign policy issues but I am not sure where we had a real impact we wanted. There is one notable exception. Uh, in, uh, uh, back in 2009, at the beginning of the Obama administration, we had a commission on policy toward Russia, which we co-sponsored with the Belfast Center at Harvard. Uh, a number of you members of our board were part of that commission. We got a fantastic reception from Secretary Clinton, from National Security Advisor General Jones. They told us that we were doing great work, uh, that they did not want, as one of them uh, put it, not to have an inch between our approaches to Russia, and then we know what has happened. Uh, I know that uh, we had a, a so-called perestroika policy, but let's face it, that perestroika or peri perigruska or whatever it was called in Russian and English, it did not lead us very far. Richard Nixon, back in 1992, uh, when uh, President Bush Sr. was still in the White House, he wrote in one of his books that the United States managed to win the Cold War, but our task was to win the peace. I don't know anyone in this room who would seriously believe that we did win the peace. And the international environment today is significantly more secure, or for that matter, more favorable to American interests than it was at the end of the Cold War. And if this is true, this is a pretty remarkable 
and a pretty alarming uh, conclusion. Fortunately, the United States is such a great power, a uniquely balanced superpower, that we can afford to make mistakes. We can afford to fail in a way with minimal costs to our overall security and prosperity. This is a true American exceptionalism. How long we will be able to succeed with this relative impunity, I don't know whether anyone has an answer, and I don't think we can operate on an assumption that this kind of questionable success will last forever. That is why it is so important for us to use our current troubles, our current sharp disagreements, our current, I would not hesitate to say, lack of civility in our presidential campaign as a mandate to take a new look at our foreign policy and at the nature of our foreign policy dialogue. As I told you, we were not very successful, but we are trying very hard. We have a number of programs at the center uh, looking at China, led by General Gregson, uh, looking at Russia, led by Paul Saunders, who just uh, opened this meeting uh, on the Middle East, led by Jeffrey Kemp. And I think they are doing a great job, but I think they are doing a great job in terms of looking at things, in terms of having serious discussions with people on the other side, not necessarily, not necessarily, at least for now, of bringing any substantive results. We are very pleased with what we are able to do with our magazine, The National Interest. Under the leadership of uh, Jacob Hebron and uh, Harry Kazianis, who started working with Jacob as managing editor, then uh, joined Heritage, and is now uh, with us again part-time as a senior editor, uh, we were able to reach a real unquestionable success with the National Interest magazine, particularly online. We uh, are now ahead in terms of the unique visitors of all comparable publications in the United States, considerably ahead of uh, foreign affairs, somewhat ahead of foreign policy, and to give you an idea how much we were able to increase our number of unique visitors, I will tell you, 27 times, 27 times, <laughs> which obviously, again in the spirit of uh, full disclosure, suggests that we have started with a very low base. <laughs> but it also suggests that now when we have an excess of 3 million unique visitors a month, and they're moving forward and forward literally every month, I think we're able to play in the big league. And we'll try to use it responsibly and assertively to promote the serious discussion about American foreign policy. Uh, you will have a number of uh, truly exceptional people on our program today. I would like to mention those members of the board who are not on the program, but who are truly indispensable to our success. Uh, these people include Ambassador Richard Baird. Rick? <laughs> who is not only a member of the board, but also Chairman of the Advisory Council of the National Interest Magazine. David Keen, opinion editor for the Washington Times, past president of the National Rifle Association, and past chairman of the American Conservative Union. You don't know, these people, unlike us, have real power, or at least real influence. Drew Gaff, who is a new member of our board, a very successful Wall Street financier with investments in Russia, in China, and elsewhere, who is giving us a sense of reality. And uh, last but not least, I don't see yet Grover Norquist, who is a, I see Grover Norquist. who is not only an important member of the board, 
but as you know, he runs a very important organization, certainly a very important organization in the conservative movement, in the Republican Party, who also gives us an important sense of reality as a person who understands both intellectual ideas and how to make these ideas to work in the American political process. This was long enough. You're already eating. Now please eat without interruption. And then we will continue uh, before your dessert is served.